Hello everyone, today we're going to look at a common creationist accusation leveled at phylogenetics and evolution generally. However, before we get there, we have to take a little detour, so let's jump right in. <laughs> I was in a formal debate with Kent Hovind, no, seriously, and this took place on Modern Day Hysteria's channel, linked to the original video in the description. This was the first formal debate I'd ever been a part of and I enjoyed it immensely, not least because I got to skewer Hovind on a number of points. One of those points involved these things called paleomagnetic reversals. This is where, when rocks form, the iron in them orient along the magnetic field and we can see in the geologic record that the magnetic field has flipped numerous times. Now, Hovind claimed that these reversals don't exist, that they're just places where the magnetic field weakened, a claim for which no evidence exists. What's weird about his claim is that the existence of the reversals isn't merely inferred by observations of modern rock or anything like that. It isn't as though geologists predict that they should exist some tens of millions of years ago, in the ancient past. Rather, the reversals do currently exist. You personally can go pick them up, study them, lick them, whatever. No other creationists agree with him that these reversals are imaginary. Andrew Snelling of Answers in Genesis, for instance, points out that they do exist, and the scientific literature is replete with examples of them. So Hovind has no reason to declare that they don't exist. Another claim that I smashed is Hovind's idea that woolly mammoths weren't polar animals. I pointed out that mammoths have the remains of arctic plants in their dung, indicating that they did indeed live in arctic regions. One thing I didn't mention though is that we can also use foraminifera and diatoms to show that their paleoclimate was mostly icy, not tropical as Hovind claimed. I discussed this in my video, Paleoclimatology. Hovind's only line of evidence that mammoths lived in the tropics was that they lacked sebaceous glands. However, a 10 second Google Scholar search yielded the 2004 paper, Sebaceous Glands of the Woolly Mammoth, Mammothus primigenius Blum, Histological Evidence, which I read during my closing statement of the debate. Uh, I looked up uh, the thing about sebaceous glands, if that's your only line of evidence, I mean that's pretty weak, but it seems that uh, no ambiguous answer has been found to the question if mammoths had uh, skin sebaceous glands. Theoretically, the living conditions of the woolly mammoth at high latitudes did not exclude substantial uh, evolutional differences from elephants. It is known that elephants have no sebaceous glands, and the only facial glands of elephants have been described as modified sweat glands actively working during the reproduction period. Here we pre present uh, documentary proof of the presence of of sebaceous glands in the woolly mammoth, Mammothus primigenius. So there is proof now of sebaceous glands in woolly mammoths. So I think you might need to revise that one and take a look at the technical literature. So why, after years of repeating the same claims, was Hoven utterly unable to do a little clicking with his mouse? His inability to fact check is almost pathological. Well, regardless, we're not here today to go on about geochemistry, ancient elephants, or every single wrong claim Hovind made during our debate. That would take hours. Instead, we're going to take a look at one of the claims from the comment section of that video, specifically this one by Jesusus Lord, that reads, quote, Evolutionary biology has been reduced to drawing lines on a page, close quote. Now, he's not the only person to claim this. In fact, all creationists implicitly make this very same claim. That's where baromenology comes in. You see, creationists draw lines on pages, too, when they assert their notion of created kinds. Creationists are only upset, though, when the lines are drawn by evolutionists. Hmm, a little hypocritical, but whatever. The simple fact is, humans have been drawing lines between organisms even before Darwin. Linnaeus invented the first rigorous method of classification that defines groups based on their shared characteristics. This systematic classification formed a twin-nested hierarchy, essentially an evolutionary tree of life. And Linnaeus did this without even having the faintest concept of common ancestry in mind. 
While taxonomy has improved over the years, the fact still remains that humans are classified as hominids, i.e. great apes, primates, mammals, vertebrates, animals, and, yes, also eukaryotes. While most creationists don't disagree with the fact that humans are mammals or vertebrates, even though that also means we have to be animals, they have to assert that all the taxa above a certain point in this twin-nested hierarchy are just fantastic coincidences that aren't violated by even a single chimera, like a pegasus. And no, the platypus doesn't count, it's a monotreme. Baraminologists attempt to figure out where this point lies by trying to determine what organisms are related to each other and which are not using a few different, contradictory methods. One of the most popular methods is hybridization, which involves crossing two species. If the species can produce offspring, fertile or infertile, then the two are part of the same kind. Well, what if they can only fertilize the egg? Well, no, that's not okay, since humans can fertilize hamster eggs when the zona pellucida is removed. Gene Leitner, Tom Hennigan, Georgia Purdom, and Bodie Hodge point out in Determining the Arc Kinds that the zygote must reach the blastocyst stage before the two can be considered the same kind. Did, did you hear the sound of those goalposts moving? But things get worse for creationists because they believe two organisms that cannot interbreed can still be part of the same kind. For example, Leitner says in Mammalian Archkinds that Canidae, the family of dogs, is one kind. But South American canids, true foxes, African wild dogs, bat-eared foxes, raccoon dogs, and the black-backed and side-striped jackals cannot interbreed with the house dogs. Leitner says a cross between a coyote and a red fox has occurred, however I can find no literature in support of this, nor does Leitner provide a citation. Should there then be multiple dog kinds? Now, creationists typically say a kind is approximately the same level as a family in modern taxonomy. But this is meaningless. For one thing, the family is relatively arbitrary. It can contain anywhere from one member, as in Placozoans, to many thousands, as in the rove beetle family Staphylinidae. So, creationists have invented a number of excuses for circumventing this classification scheme when it's not convenient. Leitner says in Mammalian Arc Kinds that sheep and cows are in different kinds, despite being in the same family, because, no joke, quote, Most people would tend to think of sheep and goats as distinct from cattle. For these reasons, it was decided to split the family and consider the subfamily the level of the kind, close quote. Popular opinion has now evidently become a reliable method for determining phylogenetic relationships, I guess. In another article, M. Aaron's Discerning Tyrants from Usurpers, a statistical baromenological analysis of Tyrannosauroidea, yielding the first dinosaur holobaromen, Aaron decides that Tyrannosaurus rex is in the same dinosaur kind as Appalachiosaurus and Eotyrannus. Bear in mind that these three are less similar to each other morphologically than we are to chimps. Curious. While we could poke fun at baromenology all day, we need to get back on track. We see that creationists do draw lines to an extent, but at what extent they stop is entirely arbitrary. Their inability to invent a rigorous method by which they differentiate organisms that are related to each other from those who aren't is encapsulated by R. N. Ra's phylogeny challenge. And, by the way, what basis do we have in the first place for drawing the lines between species at all? Well, as I've explained in other videos, a combination of genetics, morphology, embryology, and biogeography help researchers determine relatedness among organisms. When we combine all these factors, we see that the relationships among all organisms form a nested hierarchy. All life has DNA, RNA, proteins, and ribosomes, for starters. Eukaryotes have nucleated cells. Opisthocons have sperm with a single posterior flagellum. Animals are multicellular with internal digestive tracts. Bilaterians are bilaterally symmetrical. Deuterostomes develop their anus before their mouth embryonically. Vertebrates have vertebrae. Tetrapods have four limbs. Amniotes develop in an amniotic sac. Mammals have hair follicles, lactal mammaries, and three middle ear bones, and... Hey, humans have all these characteristics. The only explanation that creationists have for this is that God reuses parts, meaning he must be supremely uncreative. The creationist assertion is also, of course, entirely untestable. 
Common Ancestry, on the other hand, is testable, as we saw in my video, Common Ancestry. Rather, the suite of characters that a group of organisms has is indicative of the fact that their common ancestor also had their shared characteristics. Recently, Aaron has been putting together a series of videos where he shows how certain characteristics have been acquired throughout evolutionary history, leading up to us. In each video, a new clade is identified by some morphological or genetic character. It forces creationists to acknowledge the shared characters among different clades, and that there are no hard and fast lines delineating kinds. The same is true of taxonomic categories. However, the difference is that evolutionists aren't claiming that these organisms aren't related to each other. Creationists must, by necessity, show that these organisms aren't related to each other. But when we look at them in the context of their characters, the creationist job suddenly becomes difficult. Let's take an example. Organisms A and B have 10 characters in common, but organism C has only 9 characters in common with them. Therefore, organism C is less closely related to A than B is. Organism D then has only 8 characters in common with all of them, so it is even less closely related to A than B or C, and so on. Creationists would have us believe though that D isn't related to A, B, or C at all. Why? Because, uh, well, reasons. So, what have we learned? Well, for starters, we've learned that Kent Hovind is evidently humanly unable to fact-check claims. Second, we've seen that baromenology is wholly unable to determine what organisms are related to each other versus those who aren't. Third, we've seen that evolution isn't simply drawing lines on a page. There are numerous lines of data connecting every point on phylogenies. So, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.